Good evening, and welcome to Doctors on Call. If you've been struggling with varicose veins, leg cramps, peripheral artery disease, or other varieties of circulation and leg problems, tonight's show is for you. I'm Dr. Ray Christensen from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth, and I'm your host tonight. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, Dr. Gail Baldwin, a family physician with Twin Ports VA Clinic in Superior, Wisconsin, Dr. Gregory Snyder, an interventional radiologist with Essentia Health in Duluth, and Dr. Emily Onello, a family physician with the Lake Superior Community Health Center in Duluth and a faculty member at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. We're ready to take your questions about circulation and leg problems. Give us a call locally, 218-788-2844 or toll free, 1-877-307-8762. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Grant Carlisle of Grand Rapids, Minnesota, Tyler Kunst of Belle Plaine, and Maddie Neeters from Sartell, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Baldwin, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, maybe where you're from and your <laughs> medical school background, training background, what you like in practice? Yeah. Well, originally I'm from Indiana. I went to Purdue in pharmacy school and then after 10 years went back to medical school and studied to be a family doctor, trained in residency in Duluth and um, then went to work, kind of did a few different things, but mostly family practice and um, now I'm working at the VA. Dr. Snyder, I, you're, you're an interventional radiologist. It'd be nice to know a little more about you too. Excellent. Uh, thank you. My name is Greg Snyder. I'm from St. Louis Park, Minnesota, where uh, I was uh, born and raised. Uh, I had the good fortune of going to the University of Minnesota for my medical school training, uh, followed by my training in radiology and then vascular and interventional radiology. Uh, served as a staff physician there for, uh, oh, about 10 to 12 years. I ran the fellowship for about four of those years or five of those years. Uh, had an opportunity to journey Northland to the Riviera of the North here in Duluth uh, with Essentia uh, about three years ago and have been very happy uh, to be providing care up here. Uh, Welcome. Thank you very much. Dr. Onello, a little about yourself. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Christensen. I am originally a New Englander. I grew up in Massachusetts and came to Minnesota for my education and for that I'm grateful. I went to Carleton College for my undergraduate and then um, a, a through somewhat meandering path, but ended up at the Mayo Med School in Rochester and stayed there uh, fortunately for a graduate um, education in, in medicine for my residency in family medicine. And then came north as well. And you've practiced out in the rural area a little bit too, haven't you? That's right, in Silver Bay, Minnesota, before I came back down to the big city here of Duluth. Mm -hmm. Well, again, welcome everyone. The night's nice program should be really interesting. Dr. Baldwin, maybe you could start us out and talk a little bit about restless legs. It seems to be something that shows up in my office quite a bit. And one of my little old people told me the best thing is a spoon of a spoonful of yellow mustard every night. So I don't know how to treat this. That's interesting. I've heard the same thing, mm -hmm. yellow mustard. Yeah. One of the interesting things that I read within the last year is that anyone who presents with restless legs should have their um, blood evaluated for iron that seems to be um, uh, iron deficiency can actually contribute to restless legs. But for most people, that's not the case. For most people, restless legs is, uh, as far as I know, no known cause. But it's a sensation that your legs just feel like they have to move, and if you try to hold them still, it's very uncomfortable. And so it disturbs people's sleep. Sometimes it disturbs their ability to rest in any way. And so, um, there are various medications for treatment. Sometimes just getting up and moving around can be helpful. But um, drink a lot of water, have your iron checked, walk around when it feels restless, and if that's not working, talk to your doc. Very good. Go see your family doc. That's right. Dr. Snyder. Yes, sir. Uh, peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease, PAD, I guess that we're going to come to initials or mm -hmm. acronyms eventually, but peripheral artery disease, what is that? So uh, a great question. Uh, peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, uh, is a, a very important group of uh, symptoms. Primarily, it's where the arteries get filled with plaque, with cholesterol plaque. 
Uh, it's very prevalent. About 10 million Americans have PAD. Generally, it presents with claudication or pain walking, but it can present a whole host of different ways. Uh, basically, if you think about it, the artery is a pipe. If you fill it with plaque, blood flow can't go downstream because the, vein, the vessel is too narrowed. Uh, PAD that presents with claudication uh, involving the lower extremities is very important. And what's so significant about it is the high correlation between problems with your legs, PAD peripherally, and central problems. It's the same uh, vascular system. So the folks who have problems with the legs oftentimes have problems with the heart. They're at a higher risk for stroke. Uh, again, it's just vessels that are being plugged. Oftentimes PAD or claudication trouble walking is one of the first signs that a patient can have some of these other uh, problems. So if we uh, achieve one thing tonight, it's really to encourage folks who are having difficulty uh, to go get screened. Talk to your healthcare provider, wherever that is, undergo certain types of screening. Uh, September, for instance, is uh, Vascular Awareness Month, and many organizations will have a Legs for Life program where you could even come in and get screened for free. Uh, but if you're having pain in your legs, pain walking, or any types of symptoms, go see your primary care provider uh, and start the conversation because oftentimes the fixes are very simple uh, without uh, major issues and we can get people up to a much higher quality of life if we can treat these things early. And maybe get them to quit smoking. Get, don't <laughs> smoke kids, don't smoke kids, <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> Dr. Onello, there's already questions coming in about varicose veins and venous stasis. Do you want to talk, uh, just give us a little background on what varicose veins are and then maybe venous stasis too if you will? Sure, I think it's perfect uh, to come following the previous discussion about arterial problems because one of the things I see with my patients is a confusion between artery problems and vein problems. Mm -hmm. And we as physicians sometimes use these terms assuming people know what they mean, but the arteries in general, uh, especially to the lower extremities, deliver oxygen-rich blood then you cross across uh, the capillary bed, and then you have veins which basically transport the blood back towards the heart. So one is one direction, like a superhighway, one way, and then the veins come back against gravity. So uh, traveling against gravity can be challenging, and so the veins are designed to have help with that. They have valves so that blood only flows one way. They take advantage of muscular activity where you can uh, compress the veins to sort of move the blood uh, up upwards against gravity. So a varicose vein is simply a vein, I think of it as over dilated, not well functioning, and so blood tends to stagnate or pool in that vein, stretching it, sometimes causing tenderness or discomfort. The visual uh, appearance that we so typically think of as varicose veins, surface veins that you can see. Arteries, again, are deep. They're, they're traveling uh, blood deep down in the tissues towards the feet veins bringing blood back up. So the stretching uh, deformity, if you will, of those v surface veins is what we all call varicose veins. For some people, it's purely cosmetic. It doesn't bother them. For other people, it can be very uh, significant, particularly if they have a job standing, such as a cashier uh, or a vascular surgeon or something or like teacher. that. Or mm -hmm. a teacher, right. Dr. Could, Ball, oh, go ahead. Could I, I, excellent, excellent description. Can I build on that for a moment? Sure, please. Uh, so, so as you suggested, um, varicose, you have much, much more uh, length of veins than you do arteries. And everything you said is 100% is true. In varicose veins, you do get increased pressure because the blood can't get out of the leg. On the arterial side, you can't get the blood down because the pipes are shut off. On the venous side, it just stays there and won't get out of the vessel. Uh, but it's, it's a huge problem. About 50% uh, of adults over the age of 50 have, have, can make clinical diagnosis for uh, varicose vein disease. Uh, we talk about women who have a slightly higher prevalence, as you know, uh, 50 to 65%, but men over the age of 50, 40 to 45%, with up to 25% of people having visible varicose veins. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's so much that can be done again for that. Uh, so uh, kudos to you, it was a great explanation. So Dr. Baldwin, how do you handle that in your office? Well, first, um, get people moving. Next, get them to r elevate their legs, at least uh, trying to get the fluids so that they have gravity in their favor instead of the other way around. And most of the time, prescribing some um, compressive stockings so that um, you get gravity and you get some elastic to work in your favor to get the blood moving in the right direction. But muscle action is really a very important part of keeping fluids moving. So having people um, both moving 
to get the muscles moving and then taking time to elevate legs is pretty important in addition to the mechanical means. What causes the staining that mm -hmm. happens with the chronic venous stasis? Well, I believe what causes the staining is um, because when the vessels are so filled, they get leaky and then the pigments from the blood then leach into the tissues and eventually that staining doesn't go away. It's sort of tattooing from the inside is the way I look yeah. at it. Mm -hmm. yes. Iron. That's mm -hmm. so important too. If, 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 uh, if someone out there has that kind of staining on your legs, the, 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 the uh, hemosiderin deposits, the, that redness, that's definitely a sign that something should be done or you should at least have it looked into. Uh, compression stockings alone, just causing compression and recreating uh, that the vessel's normal tone so now blood won't pool as much uh, can be, in many cases, all that a patient needs or a person needs to be comfortable again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I will say, just to build on what you said about restless leg, I know we do a fair amount of varicose vein work and one of the things that we've found is that, at least in, uh, in the population we've seen, it people who present with restless legs as one of their symptoms along with the other myriad of symptoms that are involved with varicose veins will oftentimes report a reduction uh, in their restless leg type mm -hmm. symptoms. Uh, so in my personal experience, I've seen a correlation between venous insufficiency and restless legs. Um, mm -hmm. so. Interesting. So Emily, then the, <coughs> another question that comes along with this is a, the rash that occurs and uh, cellulitis and then ulcers. Mm -hmm. um, that's you see right. that very often in your practice? Yeah, I think that, that it's important to understand these issues become a, a spectrum or a continuum. So you can have simply a ropey looking prominent vein that we would call varicose vein and then move into a more significant impairment of fluid flow back towards the heart and, and then you might get kind of a, a generalizably, we call it almost a wooden looking or mm -hmm. thickened distal leg that has those possibly those characteristic color changes, but also may appear swollen. It may also appear um, uh, reddened. And so because the tissues are somewhat distorted by fluid and, and impaired flow, it does put a person sometimes at risk for further complications. Doesn't always happen, but if they were to get a bite or a scratch, they may be at increased risk for infection setting in. And then under t over time, having that distortion of the tissue, one can start to get skin changes, like it starts often as a real dry rash. A person will have a, a reddish area that's flaky or dry, um, itchy often, and then sometimes the skin will actually break down into mm -hmm. what we call a venous stasis ulcer, meaning a breakdown of the surface of the skin because the blood isn't flowing, as you know. And I would say that's fairly common, and the, the measures that we've talked about earlier are important to catch before you get to the point where you're now having skin breakdown or even mm -hmm. bothersome uh, rash or dermatitis, we call it. What's cellulitis? Oh, good point. Cellulitis is an infection, a bacterial infection of the skin. And what's so tricky is we mentioned earlier that long-term vein problems can make the skin look swollen and red. Mm -hmm. And yet you'll read if you go on the internet or talk to people, one of the symptoms of cellulitis is swollen red skin. So it can often be very tricky to determine in, in patients with severe vein problems uh, what you're dealing with. But the cellulitis being that it's an infection will often have a component of rapid worsening, it will get redder, it will expand, it may be more painful than typically mm -hmm. the person would have, and also may be accompanied by general symptoms such as fever, chills, uh, feeling like you're physically ill. So cellulitis being that it's a bacterial skin infection can be a very serious condition, and if certainly in anyone, but particularly if you have other health issues, such as diabetes or hardening of the arteries where the blood flow may not be adequate to get antibiotics down there. So uh, something certainly that we watch for and we're always grateful when patients come in if there's been a change in their, in their leg skin. I always remember when, uh, with Dr. Baldwin's comments, the calf or this, the gastrocnemius and the soleus are the second heart uh -huh. in a way that right. when you mm -hmm. pump your legs uh, sitting on an airplane or wherever, it's good to pump the legs and pump mm -hmm. the circulation back up. Mm -hmm. We need to move on into peripheral artery disease. Uh, Dr. Snyder, do you want to kind of just chat with the, us a little bit about, uh, or Gail, mm -hmm. are you diagnosing this over at, at, with your clientele? Well, um, if you want to start us and then we'll move on through that. I guess that, you know, from the family practice approach, we don't have a lot of 
tools in my location for looking at um, peripheral artery disease, but you first check pulses. It's simple. You touch. You try and feel a pulse. If you can't feel a pulse, um, you look at how the circulation is going. Does the um, foot pink up if you push and, and blanch a spot under your finger, and then does it pink up quickly or not? Um, if you can't feel a pulse, can you hear a pulse using a machine that listens called a Doppler? And then um, you can um, compare the pulses in the legs uh, to the blood pressure in the legs to the blood pressure in the upper extremities to look for clogs, if you will, mm -hmm. in the arteries of one leg versus the other if you're seeing particular symptoms that are not symmetrical. So, Dr. Snyder, then they end up on your doorstep uh -huh, if, we, if right. we're not successful. Uh, yes, as a vascular and interventional radiologist, uh, we are uh, surgeons without scalpels. So we can do much of the repair uh, through a tiny needle puncture into an artery using a combination of catheters, little balloons to stretch open uh, narrowings, or tiny metal stents that go in and keep the vessel open. Uh, but I'd like to build on what you said about diagnosis. Uh, as, as you so rightly pointed out, one of the easiest ways to diagnose uh, is the ankle brachial index where you just take blood pressures uh, at the ankles and at the arms. You have one pump. It pumps out at one pressure and they go out to the four different areas. And if you have wildly different pressures, this leg being normal, this leg being much, much less, you know that there's a blockage in the pipe. Uh, it's a very easy test to get done in a primary care setting. Uh, with that and non-invasive ultrasound, we can screen someone and know uh, almost uh, with 100% certainty where there is a problem and what we can do to fix it. And many of the fixes are same day outpatient, tiny needle poke, you're, you're back home the very same day with now a leg that works. Uh, I want to build quickly on what you said about venous, uh, about venous disease and ulceration. We know that ulceration occurs in about 1% of adults over the age of 60 and lead to chronic infections. And invariably, every one of those cases is because of too much pressure on the venous side uh, for the reasons that you mentioned, the second heart. The valves break down, and even though the second heart is pumping, trying to get the blood up, it whooshes up and whooshes right back down. So oftentimes, again, a simple outpatient procedure, we can close those broken vessels and we can reroute the blood to the normal or more normal vessels and cure these ulcers before patients have to lose limbs. Uh -huh. Critically important if you're diabetic. You can't mess around if you're diabetic, but uh, if you're an elderly diabetic person, you already know this because you're an elderly diabetic person, you've, you've made that cut, so. Uh -huh. The word claudication, um, somebody want to take a shot at uh, defining what that means? means that it hurts real bad when you walk very far um, and usually it's one limb versus the other although you can have claudication. The claudication means a clogging if you will of the artery that's supplying the uh, oxygen to the muscles. So it's sort of like getting a charley horse, uh, well not that, mm -hmm. sort of like getting a stitch in your side when you were a kid when you were running too much. That's sort of the same idea. You're not getting enough oxygen where you need it and so it hurts, and it hurts really bad, and some people can't walk very far at all. Some people say, oh, you know, I walk 20 feet, I have to stop. Mm -hmm. I can rest for a while, then I can go again. I walk 20 feet, and then I have to stop. And then I start walking 15 feet, and then I have to stop. And pretty soon, I just stop. So um, that's what claudication acts like. And that's the critical piece is that it gets better when you rest it because I can think a lot of my patients who may have knee arthritis or things may be watching thinking, well, it hurts me to walk too, but I think it's, a, as you point out, a real specific pain in the muscle, usually the calf, but not always. It can be any mm -hmm. muscle that hurts to activate and then um, alleviates with rest until you do the activity again. So the differential of claudication, because there's other questions in here, that are relating back to possibly disc disease, spinal stenosis, mm -hmm. and other things. So the differentiation that you were talking about, the walking and stopping, and how do we define and decide as physicians between a vascular problem versus a neural problem. Um, mm -hmm. You guys want to discuss that just a little bit? Uh, I'll take a swing. Well, I mean, a, a nerve problem, uh, one, through medical imaging, uh, you, you potentially, I mean, the, the, the initial diagnosis would be done with physical exam. Uh, if there was a strong question about a nerve problem, you would most likely get an MRI to look for any disc abnormality. But from a clinical standpoint, they present uh, fairly differently. I mean, the, the, the key about 
having it get better when you rest is really pivotal. Nerve pain generally won't do that. It'll be a more defined shooting pain that's constant, uh, can increase with weight bearing or load bearing. Uh, but I think a, 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 a qualified physician, a licensed physician, uh, a, a, will be able to identify uh, most of that with just the basic physical exam uh, because of the difference in how they present. And the difference in pain from a cramp to the Mm -hmm. uh, tingling, yes. numbing, uh, shooting, all the symptoms that you don't get with arterial uh, or venous disease. Those are much more uh, throbbing, swelling sort of symptoms. Raynaud's syndrome. There's some questions about the hands, uh, about frostbite. Mm -hmm. um, someone's had frostbite in the past and now they get in trouble with their hands. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that in your office. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Want to start us out on that? Yes, the term for that. Did they use the term chill blains too? Or I something used to. Like I think that. that's. Yeah. I think that's Maybe the old. In the before myself. time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's an yeah. Eastern term. Oh, an Eastern okay. term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's very interesting. I, I definitely think of post uh, frostbite exposure um, as a as a completely different entity from mm -hmm. Raynaud's, which is sort of a, a temporary vasospastic. Raynaud's being where the blood vessels spasm in response typically to cold exposure. And yet you talk about the distal fingertips turning different colors, red, mm -hmm. pale, white, even sometimes blue as they reflush. Um, and so I think that that being a separate entity uh, than, than post frostbite exposure where those, those distal digits can also be sensitive to re-exposure to cold. Um, and, and I just wanna get in, I think what makes things complicated here, and I know all my colleagues have seen this, Unfortunately, there's no rule that says a person can't have two things at <laughs> once. Both. So yeah. you can be having venous problems and Raynaud's. And, and again, I echo what you're saying, that, that teasing these out really sometimes takes time in a nice mm -hmm. interview setting with your physician. And, um, and so you know, finding out if someone's had a frostbite exposure in the example you gave may steer you towards that diagnosis rather than, say, a Raynaud's. When you hear the mm -hmm. typical symptom pattern, often that, in addition to imaging and physical exam, really can help us narrow down what we're, what we're dealing with. Smoking. Smoking. <laughs> don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> Only if you smoke menthols. Yeah. yeah. Don't it smoke. It doesn't yeah. help smoking anything. Doesn't but I think anything. it's important because we're talking about things that may narrow or impair blood vessel function. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that among many, you know, smoking uh, compa compounds in cigarette smoke do many things, but they vasoconstrict, yeah. so if you already have narrowing, you're making narrowing worse. If you have inflammation in the vessels, vessel walls, you're making that worse. So there are lots of reasons why smoking is actually bad besides just telling you not to do it. Yeah, no, yeah. completely, absolutely right. It's physiologic, it's, it's a poison, it's constantly causing the arteries to narrow aside from the tar uh, that you're putting in your body. Uh, it, it's, it, smoking correlates with just about every cancer that we know about, we can correlate it with an increased smoking. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are plenty of programs that are available to help stop smoking. If you're smoking and can't stop, uh, the, the state offers many programs that are out there. Talk to your primary care provider. It's, it's important that you stop no matter how long you've been doing it or how old you are. I'll tell you in our practice, just about everyone we see for arterial and oftentimes venous disease is a smoker. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, it's a real issue. Yes, right. Your PharmD can help you also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to go to the physician, see your pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Dr. Baldwin, why do I get cold feet at night? <laughs> well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Circulation could be one. You may need to turn up the heat in your house. <laughs> 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 Wear your socks. It, it has, uh, sometimes it has to do with circulation. Sometimes it actually has to do with nerve function. Some people who have diabetic neuropathies will feel it as if they're cold, even when their feet are not cold to the touch. So there are uh, so many reasons for cold feet. I don't have all of them. Mm -hmm. It can be a sign of arterial or venous insufficiency. Mm -hmm. So what, yes. what really causes the leg cramps at night? We've got a little question. bit of time left. Uh -huh. yeah, we yeah. can go out <laughs> talking about it. Yeah, very common. <laughs> leg cramps yeah. at night being common as well. But, but. Hydration. Yeah. So make sure you're getting plenty of water. Does the mustard help? <laughs> uh, I have several patients who tell me it does. I have no studies that would prove that, but oh, I, yeah, I, it can't hurt gonna, much. I'm going to have to look that yellow up. Yellow mustard. Uh, yep. What can it They hurt? had both heard about yellow mm -hmm. mustard. I was out of the loop on yellow mustard. And you'll mustard. hear tonic water as well yeah. because of the quinine, the quinine and that I've yeah. heard. things like that. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. something to talk yeah. to your physician about because it can be an imbalance of some of the chemicals in the blood, such yeah. as 
magnesium and calcium yep. and things like that. Fast question, Emily, what's oh. a baker's cyst? Oh, wow, okay, we're shifting gears. Yes. My understanding of a baker's cyst is uh, a kind of a, flu a joint fluid collection an outpouching, if you right. will, that occurs right behind the knee and that kind of that crook or fold behind your knee. And many people have them and don't even know. If they get big enough, you might start to feel them. And they can burst and cause some temporary but excruciating pain as yeah. that fluid kind of leaks out. Well done. Okay, uh, you're credit. great, good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, great show tonight. I wanna thank our panelists, Dr. Gail Baldwin, Dr. Gregory Snyder, Dr. Emily Onella, and our medical student phone volunteers. Great questions, nice handwriting, it's good to be able to read it, <laughs> much better than mine. Grant <laughs> Carlisle, Tyler Kunst, and Maddie Needers. Uh. Please join Dr. Alan Johns for a program next week on cholesterol problems when his, problems, when his panelists will be Dr. Dorr, Dr. Joseph Dorr, Dr. David Hutchinson, and Dr. Jake Powell. Thank you so much for watching and have a great night. <laughs>